please welcome to the stage our moderator and three visionary regulatory commissioners. Janet Gale Besser, Managing Director, Regulatory Innovation and Utility Business Models, Smart Electric Power Alliance. Jennifer Potter, Hawaii Public Utilities Commission. Brian Sheen, Illinois Commerce Commission. Letha Tani, Oregon Public Utility Commission. innovation on the regulatory front. Before we begin, I want to talk a little mechanics. We're going to have opportunities for you to ask questions, and to do that, we want you to use the technology called Slido. You can submit your question and vote for the question you want to have answered by joining us at www.slido.com with the code that you see on the screen, hash SPI 2019. So we hope that you will be participating in this discussion, but we're going to lead off at this point. Um, as we heard last night, and as Abby just mentioned, the pace of change in the electricity industry is accelerating, driven by new, emerging, and innovative technologies, many of which you can see on the showroom floor, changing economics, and increasing customer expectations. This accelerated pace of change poses challenges for regulation and market design, how to capture the benefits of innovation for all customers, as Paula pointed out last night, the implications for the system of increasing distributed energy resources, driven more and more by customer choices and declining costs than policy, and the implications of increasing commitments to a carbon-free energy future. During this general session, state regulatory commissioners will discuss ways they are evolving regulatory processes, practices, and structures to keep pace with the dynamic change in the energy industry while maintaining safe, reliable, affordable, and increasingly clean electricity. We are fortunate to have with us three commissioners. First, Letha Tawney, commissioner at the uh, Oregon Public Utility Commission. Brian Sheehan, Commissioner and former Chair of the Illinois Commerce Commission, and Jenny Potter, from the Commissioner at the Hawaii Public Utilities Commission. They'll each speak for five minutes or so, and then we will uh, go into our questions. So, Letha, why don't we start off with you? Well, thank you, and thanks for having me this morning. I would uh, forgive the audience for thinking the session title is an oxymoron. Uh, and that there's this, this roll their eyes at the idea of innovation in the regulatory space. But we know that we are crucial to an equitable, stable evolution of this sector that doesn't leave anybody behind. And that may not sound like innovation to a sort of Silicon Valley disruptor, but I think really stable and clear, transparent regulatory environment is, is crucial for innovation because it reduces risk for the innovators, for the investors, for the early adopters. Uh, and it helps to uh, eliminate some of the information asymmetry that you get between incumbents and new entrants. Um, and so the role we play, I think, is, is crucial, although I'm sure for everyone in the audience, we don't move fast enough, no doubt. Um, in Oregon, we have started down that journey. Uh, we did a report for the legislature last year um, about the future of the sector and what we think is coming. And in that, we really started to focus on how can we step back from individual technologies and having individual pricing um, for individual uh, technical solutions and start thinking about responsive um, pricing around values. What are you bringing to the grid? What service? Uh, and, and how do we get consistency across all of those services and how we're pricing them? Uh, what's the price signal that's being sent out to the larger uh, landscape? And I think that's important because we don't know which technology is going to be the winner. And if we can set up a landscape where the technologies can compete against each other, that'll be better for the end customer in the end. And we also don't know what customers are going to bring to the system. They are pursuing new opportunities, new choices. Uh, and sometimes those choices bring a lot of value to the system. Sometimes it's declining value. The next marginal customer choice brings less value. Um, and if we're sending those signals out uh, as best we can in our vertically integrated, uh, no RTO, Northwest market, 
then I think we set up a landscape for, uh, for innovation that's, that's healthy. That's backed up by a, an investigation into capacity. What does, um, when do we need to pay for capacity? What does that look like? What's the actual service we mean when we say capacity? Uh, people sort of throw the word around, but what you actually need on the grid is you need more specificity before you can pay for it, so we're pursuing that. But I'm really glad um, this session and, and the um, larger conference is thinking about equity. You know, in our sector, in the industry, uh, energy industry, we point a lot to the communications revolution that happened with the iPhones and so on, and that was fantastic. Um, I know I have two iPhones, because uh, I get to work for the state, so I must love them so much. Uh, but that revolution, it's, it's added a whole, a whole new sector of jobs, right, contract jobs for sometimes low-skilled. Um, uh, participants in the economy, but you have to be able to pay the bill and you have to be credit worthy enough that you can get the phone. And so in some ways, that revolution's left folks behind and raised barriers to economic participation. And we, we gloss over that a little bit. It's, a, it's an afterthought on whether the technology um, is, is really meeting the needs of, of those communities. My kids go to a low income, a predominantly low income school, and there's a fair number of families who are stuck with really crappy phones from the grocery store at really high prices. And they don't get to participate in those economic opportunities. And I think in the energy sector, you know, we've provided electricity across this very dispersed Western community um, through a social contract. And we need to be really thoughtful about what reinforces that social contract and what erodes it. And DERs can absolutely reinforce it. There's no question they have a role in that. Um, but I worry a lot as a commissioner about are we raising more barriers to participation in the economy, to communities thriving, or are we always reducing them? Because it's already difficult enough to dig out of, of poverty in the US. Um, and I don't want this revolution to add to any of those barriers. Uh, and so when you have a commission that's asking hard questions, when you're coming to a commission and you're getting hard questions about the risk that's being put on customers or uh, what's this going to do to bills, it's those, it's those folks that are front of mind for me. Um, and I think this industry is well served when it can articulate what it brings to the system in terms of public benefits. Customer choice in and of itself is not automatically a customer benefit, but it could be. There can be ways to make that link. And um, I think also in our industry, we struggle with those folks just being flat out not in the room. And it's really hard to be sure we're meeting their needs when they're not at the table in the conversation. So I think we play a variety of important roles, and we're trying to tackle it really concretely. Um, in a variety of ways, but there are these long-term arcs that we also have to keep our, our eyes on. In particular, who are we inadvertently leaving behind? Great. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you. Brian, your thoughts? Thank you, Janet. Uh, let me just start by thanking uh, you and Julia and SIPA for the invitation to be here. Uh, this is an exciting time to be uh, in this industry, and I appreciate the thoughtfulness of getting the perspective of state regulators. Dialogues like this are really a valuable opportunity for us to listen and learn from people on the front line and adds a lot of clarity and perspective to the decisions we make as regulators. As all of you know, the business of generating, distributing, and using electricity is really at a crossroads. The declining cost of wind, solar, battery storage, the digitalization of the grid, and electrification of transportation represent game changing trends that policymakers, regulators, and the industry have to view holistically with an eye towards the public interest, consumer cost, and overall value. I'd like to help set the table a little bit for our discussion by providing some background on what we're doing in Illinois to promote innovation. Dating back to Samuel Insull's invention of the modern public utility in Chicago in the late 1800s, and his application of economies of scale to the generation and distribution of electricity, Illinois has been a leader in the provision of safe, reliable, affordable, and as Janet pointed out, increasingly carbon-free electricity for more than 100 years. 
More recently, in the late 18, uh, 1990s, Illinois became one of the first states to deregulate our wholesale electricity markets and went from one of the highest cost states in the country to one of the lowest. In 2011, we passed the Energy Infrastructure Modernization Act, which created a long-term $2.6 billion investment plan to upgrade and digitalize the existing grid. The law also included provisions for reliability, subjecting utilities to a recovery mechanism tied to outage duration and frequency. These investments have paid off with record reliability and resiliency. And by the end of this year, we'll have 100% statewide rollout of advanced metering infrastructure to almost 6 million customers. Recognizing the importance of zero carbon energy in December of 2016, the state passed the Future Energy Jobs Act, which has been described as the most significant climate and clean energy law in our state's history. FEJA reaffirmed the state's goal of 25% renewables by 2025 and provides a budget of over $200 million annually to help get there. We expect the law to create about 3,000 megawatts of new solar and 1,400 megawatts of new wind, and also annual persistent reductions in total electricity used by 18% annually by the end of the 10-year duration. According to the Environmental Defense Fund, FEJA will result in an estimated 12 to $15 billion in new capital spending on energy efficiency and renewables through 2030. EDF estimate, estimates that the law will reduce harmful carbon dioxide emissions by more than 33 million metric tons annually or the equivalent of more than seven million cars. Combined with the ongoing impact of market and environmental changes, Illinois is closing five coal plants this year, will likely reduce our carbon emissions from the power sector by more than 50% by 2030. Our new governor, J.B. Pritzker, supports an aggressive new goal of 100% carbon-free generation by 2050, so progress will likely accelerate. To experiment with the integration of renewables and to improve resiliency, we've authorized the development of two of the most advanced microgrids on the planet. Ameren's microgrid adjacent to the campus at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign seamlessly integrates wind, solar, battery storage, and natural gas generation at utility scale voltages on an active feeder. Commonwealth Edison's microgrid in the Bronzeville neighborhood of Chicago will also integrate renewables, batteries, and electric car charging. And when paired with a microgrid on the campus of the, uh, of the uh, Illinois Institute of Technology, it will become the first utility-scale microgrid cluster in North America. Clustering will assist our understanding and development of the grid of microgrids and will help open a door to the reliable in integration of millions of smart, distributed resources in the future. As we know, the tru to truly optimize the smart grid with renewable generation, batteries, and EVs, massive computing power and analytics will be necessary on a scale that's only economically feasible through cloud computing. Illinois is the first and only public utility commission currently pursuing a rulemaking allowing the capitalization of utility cloud computing expenditures, which will level the playing field between cloud and on-premise computing and eliminate the perverse financial incentive to invest in antiquated technology solutions. While we can't foresee all of the new technologies that are necessary for moving towards a lower carbon intensive future, as regulators, we can provide leadership and frameworks that encourage innovation rather than stifle it. Thanks again for the opportunity to be here, and I look forward to our discussion. Great, thank you, Brian. Jenny? Hi, yes. Uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you, SIPA, for inviting me to participate. Thank you, Janet, and my fellow panel members. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I am from Hawaii, and Hawaii is a very distinguished from the rest of the country in the way that its electrical infrastructure is structured. Uh, we have six distinct and isolated island grids. They're served by four utilities. One is a co-op, and the other two, three, I'm sorry, <laughs> are um, integrated, uh, vertically integrated um, IOUs, or investor-owned utilities. Uh, the 
the utilities of, in Hawaii have experienced unprecedented adoption of photovoltaics and electric vehicles. We rank number one per capita in um, photovoltaic adoption for rooftops and number two in the country for electric vehicles. What's remarkable about this, in Oahu, one out of three homes, single family homes, has photovoltaics on it. And it's literally changed the way that we, can, we think about doing business with the electric industry and how we regulate as regulators. Uh, so we've introduced over the last decade several mechanisms that have attempted to address some of the challenges that have come up from the, the way that customers are making decisions on how to use energy and where they get their electricity from. So this includes things like energy efficiency, where we have very aggressive energy efficiency portfolio standards. We also have, we're the first state in the country to adopt a 100% renewable portfolio standard. And we also recently adopted a carbon neutrality uh, standard. Because of this, and these ambitious state policies, as well as customer decisions about how, how to actually access their energy and electricity. They, the commission has been tasked with thinking about how to continue the utility's viability and structural in integrity in the face of basically undermining financially um, how, how they achieve their revenues. And first, this began about a decade ago with what I will refer to as performance-based rate making. And there's a distinction that I'd like to draw and propose to all of you between performance-based rate making and performance-based regulation. To begin, I'd like to talk about performance-based rate making in as much as that's what we started about 10 years ago and we've built out and upon over the last 10 years to, to where we are today with performance-based regulation, which was uh, mandated by the state and legislature uh, in 2018. So in performance-based rate making, it really is the idea of how to assist the utility to make and be viable when consumers are making, change, are making um, decisions about how to achieve and how to access their electricity and, and use electricity uh, that, that differs from the conventional type of electricity delivery from a centralized resource. So the, 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 um, the commission instituted a docket called decoupling. And decoupling is, is breaking the link between utility revenues and the sale of KWH. So essentially, the utility no longer had to rely on a quantity of KWH being sold in order to recover an appropriate amount of revenues in order to remain viable. The next step in that process was to look at multi-year rate plans, and that meant that the utility would actually stay out from coming in for a rate case over a three-year period. And this was really an idea to, one, to encourage administrative efficiency, but two, to also encourage the utility to look at ways to reduce cost internally so that they were competing in a way that was more consistent with a competitive business environment. So we evolved through a period of time. We introduced some revenue adjustment mechanisms and finally ended up in 2018 where we said, look, we've got independent power producers that are coming online with large scale solar projects and batteries. We have wind turbines and the utility is no longer making these large capital investments. And the mandate that was given by the state at that time was, okay, break the link between the capital investments that, uh, from the utility and the revenues that they recover. And so that means that for every dollar that the utility spent on the capital investments, they used to get an automatic or guaranteed rate of return of whatever was established within a, a, um, a rate case. And in our case, it's 10 and a half percent. So the idea of breaking that link is obviously not very exciting to the utility. Um, we need to, to think of ways that we could encourage them to come along for the ride with, in a way that they felt that their financial stability and security would be, remain intact. And so what we've done in the first phase of, of this proceeding, which began last year in July, 
The first phase lasted about a year. We encouraged um, participants from a number of parties. We had 10 different stakeholder groups with over 18 participants that came to the table and very actively participated in trying to help us develop what metrics, what kind of outcomes, what goals we needed to focus on in order to really change the fundamental way that we regulate the utility. Because if you're breaking the link between capital investments and revenues, you have to figure out a way to replace how those revenues are being accumulated by the utility and do it in a way that isn't going to share, scare away the shareholders because there's a, this is a much bigger, bigger scene than just the vertically integrated utility. And so the, through this process of the first phase, we came up with three goals which can a, a, apply to all utilities across the country. This is enhancing the customer experience, improving the utility performance, and then finally advancing the societal goals, which relates back to the public policy goals that are set by our, by our legislatures and our governor. So in that, we came down from 29 different outcomes that were related to those goals down to about 12 outcomes. Those outcomes include things like DER asset effectiveness. And when I state what that is, that means utilizing all of those DERs that are scattered throughout our islands that customers have adopted and utilizing them in a way to support grid functions and to provide services to the grid, very similar to what, what was discussed earlier. And so um, also interconnection, uh, interconnection experience for providers and for, and for uh, customers. So penalties associated with not providing service for interconnection to the degree or a standard that's been established and then incentives to, for, for the performance that exceeds that standard. Uh, there's a wide range of these which would fall under a, what's called a performance incentive mechanism where they need to be real capital intensive in, um, mechanisms that would allow the utility to recover basis points, if you will, in order to st remain viable. And we, we plan on including about six of those performance incentive mechanisms within this next phase, which will go on for about a year while we flesh out those details. The idea here is really that Hawaii is at the cusp of, of moving very quickly towards its 100% renewables. It has the very unique challenges because it's an isolated grid or multiple grids and that we have a large population to serve that's already early adopters of different types of technologies, primarily because the cost of energy is so high. We have the highest prices in the country, sometimes by two, per two times that of other utilities throughout, throughout the country. And really, we need to provide and enhance the customer experience where we have more equity and equality for those folks that can't afford photovoltaics and that are facing high energy burdens. And how is it that we address those? And we're more capable and able to do that through a performance-based regulatory framework than we are under the conventional regulatory compact that has existed for the last 100 years. So I'm happy to be here today and welcome your questions. Um, hopefully you'll have some for me and uh, look forward to the rest of the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny and Brian and Lisa. So just a reminder, um, if you have questions, please enter them in Slido. And I'm going to start with a few questions of my own, and then we would love to get to your questions. Um, so Brian, I want to come back to you and talk a little bit about how, uh, ask you a little bit about how the changes that you're making are helping you to manage risk and uncertainty. The utilities perceive risk and uncertainty that they'll recover their costs if they invest in new technologies. Um, and from talking with regulators, I understand regulators are concerned about the risk and uncertainty uh, around the performance of these technologies and whether they really will benefit customers. And I know you've done some thinking on this issue. Yeah, I think that you know, traditionally the way we think about it is, is a, is a cost-benefit analysis. But when you're talking about innovation, it's almost by definition hard to um, assess the cost and benefit and, and the risk. And uh, so my uh, legal and policy advisor, Jimmy Zhang, and I wrote an article for Utility Dive a while back on applying the idea of a sandbox to uh, utility spending. Um, and so, you know, if you think about it, this was mentioned last night, I mentioned it this morning, the essential uh, regulatory framework hasn't changed in more than 100 years. And uh, the premise is to um, uh, 
in lieu of market forces, impose some discipline on a company uh, to produce the most economically uh, efficient result. Um, and the problem is that uh, you know, they're, they're, it's all incentive-based. And so the utility is going to do what they get incentivized to do. Um, they're not incentivized to innovate, which is really apparent when you look at the, the, their R&D spending. So probably for most companies in this room, uh, high-tech companies spend about 25% of their revenue on R&D. Utilities spend less than 1%, and most, and, and most spend far less than 1%. So we need to find a way to um, allow the utilities to take some risks and not be penalized. Uh, we don't have to get crazy with it. Um, in Illinois, we have a very robust stakeholder process, and I think we can involve that process in determining good candidates for uh, a sandbox experiment where, uh, on a very accelerated basis with a light regulatory touch, you let the utility experiment, and uh, really without the fear of, of a penalty uh, if they fail. Um, and so that's something we have a stakeholder group working on now. Uh, it's something that uh, I hope we'll see more of and could be a perfect tool for uh, experimenting with a lot of the technologies I think that are represented at the conference and uh, certainly represent the, the trend of where the industry is going. Great, thank you. Jenny and Lita, your thoughts on managing risk and uncertainty? Well, I think we're, we've promised the legislature and are in, uh, and, and are trying to figure out how to schedule in a very heavy set of dockets and, and other transformational things happening, um, how to take on performance base. Um, we probably start with rate making on a couple of narrow issues um, because the challenges in Oregon are a little different, but the, the underlying tension that both Brian and Jenny have described around the shareholders expect you know, ROE on capital, that's what brings them to the table, um, trying to pivot that gently. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think cybersecurity is a really interesting, I personally am really interested in whether cybersecurity is a place where that performance based rate making could apply because cybersecurity is a space where you need the utility to be innovating. You need them to be not taking a compliance mindset, but really trying to reach out further. Um, and you could think about PBR being apl applied in that context, a place where you really do want them to be trying to reach the edge um, rather than the more conservative approach. Anything to add, Jenny? Yeah, I, I, th I think that, that one thing that we've, we've, we're very sensitive to the risk and because we've, we've heard it over and over from investors, we've heard it from the utilities that if you do this too quickly, then you're, you're gonna undermine our business and you're, gonna, you're literally gonna take us out in, in the stock market. And so, so we've, we recognize the need to go slowly, but we also recognize that breaking the link, you know, between capital investment and, you know, and revenues isn't entirely possible at this juncture because we haven't done grid mod. And grid modernization is absolutely critical to where we're going down the road. So, so to say, okay, we're pulling the rug out from this completely and not allowing this anymore, we have to put in safeguards and mechanisms in, that will allow for the companies to make major project investments and still recover those costs within the rate base um, over time and hopefully more, more quickly than, because I'd like to see AMI within the next year, but unfortunately we can't move that quickly. But the, uh, the idea is to, to, to get this in the ground and to really continue down the road with some of these capital investments, allow them to a, get a, a return on investment, but slowly over time be phasing out how we're looking at, at doing this. Really what we're, we're talking about is trading out inputs for outcomes. We want the utility to perform based on outcomes, no longer on inputs. Can you manage to performance rather than to cost recovery? And that's ultimately what this is about. And so that risk of making that shift does need to happen over time and it needs to transition um, rather slowly, unfortunately. <laughs> so in order to keep everybody comfortable that's sitting in the room, so. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So speaking about everybody sp sitting in the room, 
you gave me a great line to, to connect these Perfect. two thoughts. <laughs> um, we heard last night from both Paula and Stephanie that you need to understand who the constituencies are. Who are you speaking to? Who is your audience? Mm -hmm. I know, Letha, in Oregon, you just uh, completed last year a very extensive mm -hmm. uh, stakeholder process. Mm -hmm. And I want to ask um, all of you how you're engaging customers and stakeholders uh, in processes mm -hmm. to implement change. And so maybe, Letha, we can start with you. And Jenny, you mentioned stakeholder process as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I think uh, better, but still poorly. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, you know, it's challenging. Our commissions are all set up with a, with a history and for very good reason in an adversarial approach, right? Somebody brings a petition, then we go into a contested case proceeding and you need to field a lawyer for eight or 10 or 24 months to participate in that contested case. And that's important because it, it's, it protects rights, it ensures transparency. There's, there's a lot of historically good reasons why we have those pr proceedings. Um, and, and I wouldn't throw them out wholesale. But I think we heard loud and clear in our stakeholder process where we really, we really tried to step back from that for a moment, facilitate a different kind of conversation, bring different folks into the room who hadn't been there um, before. It's very common to sort of end up with the same sort of four or five constituencies at, in every case. Um, and that, uh, I think that was quite successful for opening our, our awareness that we need more collaborative processes. Connect, contested cases are not great for coming up with creative collaborative solutions because the idea is somebody, the first applicant, puts forward an idea and everyone else spends all their time explaining why it's a really awful <laughs> idea and it's going to collapse everything. And, and you know that's how the contested case proceeding pro goes forward. And then we're stuck with a record because we have to make our decisions on the record that has sort of this very odd um, uh, filled out sort of vision of what's possible. And then we have to make a decision and then justify it to the appellate court. And so that, that's not ideal for innovation. Um, so we're trying to, trying to experiment with more workshops. You see that uh, with commissioners attending workshops. Mm -hmm. That might sound rev not revolutionary, but it is. Uh, and, and that's taken, um, that's taken some effort to get constituencies, not just the utilities, but also the IPPs and others, comfortable. So our, uh, our chair, uh, Chair Decker, successfully managed to organize uh, four transmission workshops where we, as commissioners and our staff, could get smart on transmission in the West. Uh, which for anybody who works in the West, you understand with no RTO and, and so on and so forth, it's not particularly transparent or straightforward. Uh, all of the constituencies were nervous about stepping into that process. There were contested cases ongoing. They were concerned that their rights were going to be um, upended in some way by trying to do this education. And it really took a diverse uh, steering committee to get everybody comfortable with the content that we were going to get to learn. And I think the lesson we took away from that is we really need the stakeholders to sometimes turn the temperature down a little bit and come to us early so that we can do the learning, so that we can hear there might be six different ideas. And then when we come to the contested case in the record, those can get hashed out in the appropriate way with the discovery and the testimony and so on. Uh, and so I think we're, we're trying to find that line um, of what's the right uh, balance between these different proceedings. When does each one suit its purpose? Um, and it's not going to be fast. And that's just a, it's just a fact of life. Yeah. So let me just step in a minute and talk about stakeholders. For this constituency, I think the usual players are the utility <coughs> force. And there's usually mm -hmm. a consumer advocate, yep. um, and it may be the commission staff is involved, yes. um, yeah. and there may be uh, an industrial, industrial advocate. customer advocate. Yeah. But some of the new stakeholders that you're really talking about bringing in are the low-income representatives, mm -hmm. the community-based organizations, mm -hmm. and the clean and distributed energy company voices, yes. which yes. haven't, you know, they're in a business and they aren't really uh, mm -hmm. familiar necessarily with the arcane regulatory process and how you get things done. And there's a real diversity among the clean energy voices, right? We, we have had, in, at different points in different dockets, um, 
relatively well-funded in um, industry associations for clean energy. Um, but, but we get a real breadth, right? There's the local producers, there's the folks that are mm -hmm. focused on DERs, there's the IPPs that want to do very large projects, and, and you, you really need a record that has that full breadth um, in order to get to a good decision. And I think if folks want different decisions out of commissions, unfortunately, they need to invest in creating different records that give us that space and let us explore those issues within our within our jurisdiction. Yeah. Jenny, yeah. your thoughts? Yeah, I, mean, I am in complete agreement. Uh, we, we, have, we were very lucky to have a, a constituency and stakeholders that participated in the performance-based regulation docket that included Tesla and, and, and representatives from AES and Sunrun mm -hmm. and, and also from Blue Planet Foundation and different environmentalist groups mm -hmm. and consumer advocacy groups. and so. The, the way that we were structuring that, because we didn't want to just throw, um, throw out sort of a, an idea and say, we're opening up this docket, give us the best and the brightest that you've got, which we have done with other dockets. But the, the staff actually proposed a scope and, and then sent it out to the parties, and the parties were able to respond to it, and then a second draft was developed with that incorporated all of the feedback from the different stakeholders into it, including areas of disagreement. And then they responded upon that. And then we finally issued a final third report in which people were able to comment on. And then the commission took all of that feedback from the stakeholder. That was part of our record. And those 10 organizations that had spent so much time and energy focused on this proceeding. And, and that, that's one thing that, that I really just have to reiterate is we appreciate your time and, and the energy and the effort that goes into participating in these dockets. It is not an easy thing. We understand it's very labor intensive and writing and responding to that, but it's absolutely critical to, to building these records that, that help us make these decisions. And in our final phase one framework that we developed, it reflects, absolutely reflects the stakeholder input and their engagement in it. it there's, there's not an area that it, it was, we just made it up. It literally <laughs> has everything to do with how, how we developed this record over time. And so if you're going to do a stakeholder process, you absolutely have to incorporate that into the process and, and into your decision making. And so. Don't be afraid to get involved. I know the regulatory process seems pretty cumbersome, but your, your input actually, actually counts, and it's really critical to helping us make good decisions. Great. Illinois is perhaps a good example of a state uh, where these decisions uh, have originated in the legislature as opposed to uh, the commission. And Illinois has a very robust and constructive stakeholder group in this space that includes the renewable industry and consumer environmental advocates, the utilities, of course, mm -hmm. but also importantly includes community-based organizations. Mm -hmm. And I think you see that manifest in uh, the Future Energy Jobs Act, uh, an important component of which is a program uh, called Solar for All, which guarantees access to solar uh, for low-income uh, uh, households, and also job training. Um, and it's um, an important component because, uh, you know, when you look at diversity and, and, you know, we heard Paula talk about it last night, um, when you go out and visit on these, um, you know, site visits, you don't always see that diversity. But uh, it's really essential, I think, in terms of, you know, building the kind of coalitions and grassroots support for, for these programs that Stephanie talked about. Um, and so I think Illinois is actually a really good example of uh, you know, how uh, these various stakeholder interests um, resulted in legislation that really, I think, is balanced. Uh, it achieves um, a lot of the goals. It achieves the utilities goals, the renewable communities uh, goals, the consumer advocates goals, 18% uh, persistent annual um, reductions in electricity mm -hmm. uses is significant, um, uh, but also uh, has these important components of, of diversity and, and, um, and equity. Uh, and so, you know, as we think about where the industry is going, 
uh, those are really important considerations and, and maybe a good model to mm -hmm. look at. Great, thank you. So I have one more question for the panelists, but I encourage all of you to be entering your questions in Slido <coughs> because we'll get you in about five minutes. Um, and I wanted to ask you, Jenny, to follow up a little bit in your discussion about making that transition from traditional, what we call cost of service based or input based regulation mm -hmm. to a more outcomes or performance based regulatory framework. Um, and it's say, what do you see as the most important or the critical path change to make? You've talked about it's going to take a year or so and understandable to change uh, a system that's been in place for a long time. But what do you see as important maybe to uh, make sure you stay on that track or accelerate it? Yeah, I, I think that, I think for the most part, it's not going to be possible to make a clean break from cost of service immediately as much as we'd like to because there's always this, I, the, one of the most important figures is, is expanding that multi-year rate plan. So right now we currently have a three-year rate plan and it's a stay out period and we'll, we're going to expand that to five years. And so that, that means that utilities cannot come back in for a rate increase for five years, which is essentially saying no cost of service in a way for five years. We're not gonna be looking at it. But what happens at the end of that five years at this point is anybody's guess. We haven't stated specifically what's going to happen. And that's not just because nobody, none of us will be in term anymore. <laughs> but it's because, um, because ultimately we, we want to see how, how the rest of these mechanisms actually play out. And there's always this this sort of true up, if you will, to a revenue requirement that comes from so, so we set a revenue requirement for the utility where they need to, uh, to make earnings up to a certain point. And we use a revenue adjustment mechanism that attempts to true that up. And it's, it's an adder onto a static rate charge. So this is all really exciting stuff. I'm sorry <laughs> about that. So, um, so in, in doing so, that revenue adjustment mechanism can fluctuate over time. And as we introduce additional grid modernization projects into the, the process, or we have IPPs that come online and they displace um, current and conventional uh, fossil fuel type fire generation because, and they're cheaper, then that revenue adjustment mechanism would go down. And so we'll see that fluctuate over the next five years and then we'll be able to determine what happens at that point. So, so there's mechanisms that we're gonna have to institute and put in place that will still keep us fairly close to that cost of service, but it's going to be changing more due to the performance. One of the things that, you know, that, that was mentioned earlier is we're, we're instituting, a, and we have already, instituted a performance incentive mechanism around adopting renewable energy projects. And so the, the utilities for 10 years, we've had a competitive bidding framework that's been encouraging the utilities to go out to competitively bid for renewable energy. And not until last year did they actually do it. And the reason that they did it is we put money on it. We said, okay, we will pay you utilities X amount of dollars if you bring in a number of projects that are below cost, below your marginal cost, at a specific, and by the specific deadline. And guess what? They did it. And they brought us eight projects and they all, eight PPAs, and seven of them were approved by the commission within three months, and so we expedited that whole process. The reason they didn't do that earlier is they did not have an incentive to do so. So the Slido question <laughs> that I'm looking at right now is in a regulated market, are the, how, how is it, what's my perspective on what's the most beneficial in supporting renewables? If you have the ability to offer percentage performance incentive mechanisms to the utilities to do what it is that is best for society, that is going to help meet societal goals, that is going to help get you to your renewable energy goals, and that is going to bring cleaner, more, more carbon neutral resources online, then performance incentive mechanisms are a darn good way to do it. But you do need to be in a market that's regulated because we have the ability to say, here's the price tag associated with you doing this or not doing it, and here's the incentive that we're willing to pay you in order to bring these things online quicker and faster. Yeah. So, Brian, what's your perspective from a restructured market or a deregulated market in terms of uh, its ability to uh, be supporting renewable development? 
Well, I, I think, um, you know, I would, I would throw in uh, all zero carbon. Yeah. So Illinois obviously is a big nuclear state. We have the largest nuclear fleet in the country. But in this case, nuclear and renewables are in the same, the same camp, really, when it comes to uh, uh, pricing at the RTO level. And the challenge is uh, that we have state-mandated goals mm -hmm. uh, for, uh, we have an RPS, of course, we have, uh, as a result of FIJA, we have a ZEC that, that mm -hmm. uh, maintains the economics of our, our nuclear power plants. Um, but uh, there is um, a really strong effort on uh, PJM's part to actually mitigate the value of those uh, subsidies. And uh, so it remains to be seen uh, mm -hmm. how this is going to turn out. Um, I've been uh, fairly outspoken and, and critical of the way that PGM has handled the situation and, and predicted some time ago that it would result in, in the collapse of their capacity markets. And I think that is still true. Um, uh, if you look at um, the political reality of um, and the strength of support in uh, and interest in renewables and in states like Illinois in um, zero carbon electricity generated by nuclear, um, they're not going to, you know, um, uh, cede that to a bureaucracy a thousand miles away. It's just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think Illinois eventually and, and other states in, in a similar position are going to pull out of those capacity markets and, you know, they're not going to look like they look today. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that's, that's, you know, there's just this tension that's unresolved. Yeah. Um, so it sounds like renewables are supported in different ways in both uh, regulated and restructured markets. You made a comment, Letha, when you were speaking about um, DERs can be either raising or removing barriers. Um, and I guess the question I want to ask you is, how can you make sure that they're actually removing barriers and that they're actually bringing greater value to all customers on the system? Well, I, I think that's the multi-billion dollar question, right? Well, I, I mean, you know, it's just sort of the, that's the existential question in some, some respects that I think we see, we're seeing play out in, in Hawaii, but in other places as well. I, you know, this is where we're, I, we're investing a huge amount in, in trying to get to that consistent um, price signal around what is, uh, what's the service as opposed to the technology. I think everyone is going to feel at the end of those dockets uh, that we're undervaluing whatever it is they're bringing to the system. They, they just are going to. Because what they're bringing to the system is their baby and yeah. it's their business model, and, and, I, and I get that. Hopefully, through a transparent process, it'll be clear why we've balanced all the interests and landed where we have, and there's a lot of data input underneath it. Um, but, you know, electricity is a tricky thing where even where there's a deregulated market on some level, price formation is still very, very heavily shaped by the regulator, either by the legislature putting in a subsidy or by the regulator trying to actually just do price formation in PURPA, mm -hmm. just set the price, here's what it's gonna be. Mm -hmm. Hopefully it's data driven on some level. Or, you know, in Oregon, we've invested a huge amount in trying to make our procurements by our utilities competitive and transparent from that perspective to try to drive that price formation. But I think all those, you know, tools, however um, clumsy they are, it's a natural monopoly on some level. There are these economies of scale that make incumbents incumbents, and so we're going to have to keep trying these different tools for price formation in order to get the best deal for the public interest. Mm -hmm. And I, I think the role of the commissioner is to keep that in mind. It's the best outcome for the larger community, the public interest, and that's, that's not always um, easy to explain. Yeah. Uh, to folks who are pretty sure you've undervalued them. Gianna, can, so I, one, can I jump in sure. real quick uh, on this point um, and, and kind of a related point that Brian Davis from Shell made yesterday. He talked about uh, the risk of aging infrastructure um, and, and talked about the role of, of distribution utilities in orchestrating deployment of DERs. 
I think one of the real barriers to greater deployment uh, is going to be uh, the condition of basic infrastructure, mm -hmm. yeah. right? And the context is a little different, but I think you know we we saw uh, some of that in the campfire uh, mm -hmm. situation mm -hmm. in California, right? Where you've got a hundred-year-old power line, one hundred-year-old transmission line mm -hmm. uh, fail, and so you know you can put a lot of fancy things out there, but if your basic infrastructure uh, isn't intact, and and I won't just pick on California. Uh, we had a situation in Chicago some years ago where the feeder that served yeah. the downtown business district failed. Mm -hmm. And it was a decades-old, yeah. paper-insulated, yep. oil-cooled feeder. Um, mm -hmm. And for many, many years, uh, ComEd had not had a, a constructive regulatory environment. I mean, let's just be honest. Yeah. And we have formula rates in Illinois because they went to the legislature and said, look, we can't get a, f a fair shake. And so they took away a lot of the commission's uh, regulatory powers mm -hmm. in terms of uh, assigning uh, ROE and the economics around investments mm -hmm. away from the commission. So having con a constructive regulatory environment is important. Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. Our, we have a statutory mandate that we've taken seriously at least the last five years to balance interests. We're not, you know, the consumer's advocate, we're not the utility's advocate, we're not solar's advocate. Um, our responsibility is to the public interest, broad, broadly speaking. Um, and so uh, part of the challenge, I think, going forward is going to be um, managing the costs of these enormous investments required uh, to um, have a system that can accept the, the levels of, of penetration of DERs that we expect. Yeah, no, that's helpful. I think I want to turn to a question we've gotten from the audience here uh, that's really very much in line with the theme of Smart Energy Week, which is this opportunity to create new partnerships uh, between all the players here, between solar, wind, and other new technologies, but also between um, the competitive vendors and the utilities. And so I think um, one of the, quest the question we've gotten is, can you think of uh, good models that you've seen where the utility has worked with third-party vendors uh, to make investments? And one, following up on your comments, Brian, I think there's also sometimes the opportunity to use what I call other people's money if, in mm -hmm. fact, there's a partnership between a competitive provider and the utility. It's maybe not all customer or ratepayer money. Mm -hmm. So any examples of good partnerships? Yeah, I, I think that the first one that comes to mind, and probably the only one that comes to mind, is yeah. is electric vehicle charging. Um, the the utilities can do all the make ready, but they're not in the business of building chargers, and they can set rates and help you know for for the electric uh, vehicle chargers themselves that may be operated and maintained by the third party. Um, and these, these obviously are, are helping consumers with range anxiety, um, with ability to charge at work. Um, so this, this would be an excellent example of where utilities would come together with a, a third party um, to help facilitate consumer choice mm -hmm. and adoption of more DERs. <laughs> Good. You know, I, I would flip that around a little bit. In our case, we have uh, restructured wholesale markets. Um, uh, and as a result, we have a lot of retail competition. We have almost 100 competitive uh, retail suppliers. And unfortunately, uh, their customers pay about $100 million more uh, every year Whoa. than they would if they got uh, just the default service from the incumbent utility. Wow. Um, and if you're a customer who wants to and is willing to spend a little more to support renewables, and there are many out there, um, and it's good that they have that choice, that's fine. But uh, they employ, I shouldn't say all, some employ uh, very aggressive marketing practices that verge on fraud. And it really detracts from uh, the industry. It, it, um, uh, it, it, Stephanie talked about grassroots, mm -hmm. at, you know, in terms of kind of building momentum. This is an example where grassroots um, in a negative way, maybe is detracting from momentum. Um, There's always the bad apple that can color well, the entire. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, well, and, and and I think it's sort of 
horror stories like that, Oregon has chosen a very, um, we have a, we have, the legislature tends to choose to designate a, a player um, to in, and invest them with the, with the responsibility. So in Oregon, uh, there is a fee on everyone's bill to go, that's the public purpose charge, that then is, is set aside um, and we act as the accountability agency for the Energy Trust of Oregon. And they are charged with going out and getting from consumers of the IOUs all the cost-effective energy efficiency. Mm -hmm. And they've done an amazing job. I mean, they, I, I'm biased. I, I'm really impressed with what they've done. They go and they get that energy efficiency for such a low dollar, you know, LCOE for the customer overall. It's, it's fantastic. LCOE um, is low cost. Low, the life, uh, cost of yeah. entry. Yes. <laughs> And, um, what it cost to do it at the beginning. Yes, and they, you know, that partnership with the utilities, I think there was a distrust that the legislature sort of, and stakeholders at the legislature said, mm, is this really, they don't have the right incentives, our private party is going to go out and do it effectively, we're going to invest this important task in this nonprofit that has all this accountability around it. Um, and it, it's, in Oregon, it's worked well. You know, there's probably other, approaches that could also work, but that, that tends to be culturally where, where we go, um, partly in, in, because we're trying to grapple in our imperfect way with, with these kinds of challenges. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we have only a few minutes left, and I wanted to give each of you a chance to, to maybe make some last comments. Well, I think it's, I would echo what Jen, Jenny's comment about your voices in the process are really important. Um, it, it can be arcane, it can be frustrating, it can feel, I am certain, like the utilities can outlawyer everybody. Right. I, I, we recognize that asymmetry. Um, and we are working hard to try to balance all of that. And, and I think don't underestimate the importance of really developing that different record, educating our staff, particularly early in a process, um, and that gives us room to get to a different decision, uh, much like I think you know Hawaii is a long way down this path, but we're all in different places on that same path, trying to get to grips with many of the same issues. Great, and make you. your arguments in the public interest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think I would just underscore that as well. Um, it's important to remember that commissions are quasi-judicial, and uh, it's really our job to um, uh, be judges and, and not advocates, and our um, responsibilities in the public interest, it's not in a particular uh, business uh, or a business uh, model. Um, but I think there were some important points made last night that you know, I'd like to reiterate, and I uh, really agree with strongly. Uh, diversity in this space uh, is going to only increase in importance. And so it's important to recognize that. Uh, we've recognized it in Illinois. Um, our utilities support about $2 billion a year in diverse supply spending. And so from the utility standpoint, uh, that's a, a really important consideration for them. Um, aging in infrastructure uh, is uh, a real issue. Yeah. And, um, Utility regulators, uh, I think, you know, they think about the rate impact uh, every day. That's, that's really front and center for us. And I think most regulators have sort of a budget in mind, if you want to think about it that way. Um, and the budget for um, new uh, things on the grid, whether it's solar or batteries or, or uh, you know, EV charging stations, um, comes after kind of the, just keeping the lights on, literally. Um, and so it's important, I think, just to keep in mind that, you know, at the end of the day, none of us want to get a call from the governor saying, why, why do you have a blackout? Why do you have a brownout, right? I mean, that's like our worst nightmare. So utility regulators and our staffs are, and, and utilities are extraordinarily conservative. And so it's important just to understand that and understand that, um, change comes slowly for the most part. Um, but there are good examples out there. I, I would hold Illinois 
out as a good example, and I'd be happy to talk to any of you about um, uh, how we've managed this change and how we see uh, the future developing. Yeah. So, Jenny? Last thoughts? Last thoughts? Excellent. And, sure. and leave me a few seconds, please. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I, I, I actually think that Hawaii's um, on an accelerated, we're on a fast track, and, and this commission in particular wants to see change um, as quickly as possible. And, and for one reason, is uh, our, our fleet of, of fossil fuel generator, generation and coal plants are the, the, the dirtiest in, in the country. Uh, we use uh, bunker fuel in order to produce electricity. Um, it's the, the, the dirtiest that you can possibly get. We use more oil than any other state in the country in order to produce electricity. We have to import all of it because as you know, we're out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And that makes us highly vulnerable to economic forces. And so the, the idea of taking our time and moving, moving slowly to this transition um, it, to, to renewable energy isn't something that we can necessarily afford, not for our customers and, their, and the, the cost of electricity, but uh, because of, of ultimately uh, the environmental impacts and the economic instability that's, that, that we, we're facing as a state. Great, thank you. Well, please join me in thanking this wonderful panel. I hear them all inviting everyone to participate. Uh, they want your voices to be heard.